Okay. מקליטים. באנגלית. Yeah, let's speak English. Okay, English. Hello. Hey guys. So, uh, Dan and I uh, just had uh, an experience. Um, so we watched uh, a documentary film. There uh, was a screening of a new documentary film. Yes. The name of the film is Black Flag. What's it about? Um, it's about the Kafir Qasem uh, massacre. When? And uh, yeah, you're, you're the historian here. You want to you wanna tell the history um, briefly? This happened in 1956. During 1956, there was a war against Egypt. Israel started a war against Egypt. And there was an expectation that there might be a second front against Jordan. And uh, there were um, a bunch, a group of Palestinian villages, villages within Israeli territory, um, people with Israeli citizenship, but still living under military um, regime. Um, and uh, a massacre occurred in one of these villages. Um, and that's what the movie was about. It's yes. a new film. And it was quite an experience, the film itself and also the... the yeah, there was like a the panel. Crowd, yeah, the crowd. It was a panel afterwards. There was a discussion. The whole thing was kind of interesting um, to, to experience, to be a part of. And we, we just walked out of there and we haven't exchanged any yeah, um, we wanted impressions to yet. Yeah, we wanted to record our, our, our first impressions uh, so that uh, there is documentation of uh, how we feel about it. How do you feel? You use the word interesting. That's my safe word. <laughs> It's not inaccurate, <laughs> but... It doesn't describe how I feel. It's like... Fuck. Fuck. Do you feel this? I'm, I felt you responding yeah. to the movie, during the yeah. movie, and also to the panel and the things that... Yeah. came out of the crowd yeah so, so it's both of those yeah I, I cried several times during this uh, this film let's see if I remember like an exact mo oh so when when so they interviewed um, well he's now uh, an, an older uh, Palestinian uh, man. Uh, he was uh, a boy of six uh, when the massacre happened and he told about he was waiting for his mother uh, to come back from work because uh, she, she was uh, 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 you know uh, picking olives and he was waiting for his mother because he wanted uh, his mother to give him the the Uh, the equivalent of two and a half cents to buy a notebook he did not have a notebook daftar <laughs> I was thinking when he was when he said daftar I was thinking that when I was a boy I would use notebooks that yeah, said daftar on them in Hebrew in it was Hebrew. a Hebrew company yes. a Jewish an Israeli company an Israeli company that said daftar <laughs> so that's the Arabic word for notebook and this was an Israeli company that manufactured notebooks yeah. and we as students it said daftar on the notebook I didn't know what it meant yeah me But neither I just found out daftar that means daftar uh, is, is, is notebook in Arabic and he he talked about uh, Dan's uh, arm is getting uh, switching arms tired so <laughs> he's doing uh, heroic work <laughs> keeping the the camera face towards us and, and capturing both of us. There's no selfie stick, <laughs> this is lovely. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, maybe I will take the, no, the phone. Okay. okay, okay, okay. So, um, and then he, he said, as, as a boy, I didn't imagine, I couldn't imagine that a woman could be murdered, that a pregnant woman, eight months pregnant, as my mother was, could be murdered. Yeah, I felt it was so uh, touching. He said, I was just a boy 
I was say I said, "Where's my mom? Why is he, why is she isn't she home yet?" My notebook. I want my notebook. He said yeah. I wasn't worried about my mom. Yeah. Like like a boy would. Like where's yeah. my notebook? He was excited about getting his notebook. Yeah. And then hours pass and the night passes and mom doesn't come home. Yeah, she doesn't and come home. And then he starts being worried about his mom. Yeah. So there were several moments like this in this film. How would you describe your feelings right now? I don't know. I'm 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 very alienated from my feelings. I, yeah. I have thoughts, not feelings. I'll hold the camera so you can describe your feelings. Well, connect to your feelings. I, I study history and yes. I, I have thoughts, so it's it's filtered okay. through thoughts. Okay. And we all know about Kfal Qasim, yes. as opposed to other massacres that I've learned I had to learn about later in life. Um, I got it. <laughs> okay. Um, Kfal Qasim is a, is one famous case. Yes. And I think it's very interesting. They talked to us about it in the military. During my military service, they talked to us about it. Mm -hmm. So this massacre occurred and there was a trial afterwards. And uh, the judge in the trial um, coined a few uh, very now famous expressions within Israeli culture. Um, a, a, a manifestly, manifestly illegal um, command yes. or order. That you you should, as a soldier, you should not obey uh, uh, an order that is manifestly illegal and immoral. Um, it's like maybe I interpret it as obviously illegal. Yeah, like obviously, manifestly, yeah. patently. Yes, yes. Illegal. Be'alil is the is the word in Hebrew, but it, I don't know if it has an exact parallel in English. And then he he became a little poetic, and he said it's it's as if there's a black flag waving above this command, this order, and you as a soldier. You need to not to obey this because this is a case where orders were given, clear orders to, to commit a massacre. Yes. Um, in order to um, drive the uh, population out of the Israeli territory into the then Jord Jordanian territory. Um, and the soldiers, it would just across the protocols in the trial, you can see the soldiers going, the, the, the prosecutor asking the, the soldiers, um, what, you, you, you just killed them in cold blood? They said yes. Even a child? Yes. What if you saw a baby? Would you shoot them? He said yes. Why? Because an order, an order, an order. They kept repeating that. I was just following orders. I was just following orders. So then the judge in his ruling, he said this. And, and then they teach that to soldiers to show how moral we are. Like, okay, we learned the lesson. Yeah. And uh, they tell us as soldiers, you're supposed to disobey an order if it's, it has this black flag over it. Yeah. And it's not defined clearly. It just... If you feel like this is this kind of a, uh, of, a of an order, you need to disobey this order. Yeah. Um, not everything is legal. Not everything that uh, your commander above you says is autom automatically legal. Um, and to me, that was for a long time as a soldier, as a Zionist. Wow, we're look at us. We're exactly. Trying to, we're trying to be moral and so on and so forth. The propaganda worked perfectly. Now, th this does. As, as propaganda this this does two things first of all you're like in your mind you're like okay we, we had a few fuck ups you know Dir Yassin a famous case Kfal Qasim a famous case maybe some Israelis might hear about one or another mm -hmm. today I know that there were dozens and at this point hundreds of uh, separate instances of m deliberate mass killings of Palestinians as such, not as soldiers, not as uh, guerrilla fighters, just as um, Palestinians. Yes. Um, hundreds, separate instances. Um, so one thing as propaganda that this does, you take just one or two cases that happen to have become famous accidentally. Um, the government did try to conceal it and for whatever reasons that we don't have to go, go into right now, it did go public and they had to um, do a trial and so forth. So accidentally, one or two cases do become famous. Um, Dir Yassin is another example. It became famous because the soldiers committing the massacre of Dir Yassin in April 1948 happened to be the right-wing militias. So the left-wing, hmm. then ruling elites, um, used left this... Left-wing, yeah. Relatively. <laughs> used this um, to... Uh, uh, 
to denounce the, the opposition, the right-wing opposition. So, just through historic accident, every, everyone knows about Deir Yassin. No one knows about other things just as horrible that have happened um, by the left-wing militias as well. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing. You take one or two cases, you make them famous, or they become famous by accident, you conceal the other ones, but it creates the illusion of, look, we're not concealing, we're talking about it. Look, everyone knows about Falkas and we learn about it in school. We put it, you know, we don't hide it. We don't hide our crimes, we do. We just take a few cases to make it seem like we don't hide it. That's one thing. The other thing is, this whole idea of illegal command that you're supposed to disobey as a soldier. So, what is that? So, I think that in Kfal Qasim, the elites learned that at least for a while, we're not going to be able to just give orders to soldiers to kill and they will kill. It will have to be more subtle. That's it. You just have to conceal it a little bit. Yeah. And then it's more subtle. And I think Israel learned in Kfal Qasim in 1956, that was one of the last massacres that I know of maybe that was the last where it was so intimate like that mm. there were many massacres after but through artillery and air power that's how you, you massacre but after I imagine that now in the last 10 months in Gaza yeah there were more cases that we now oh. don't know about yet but no we know we know we know of um, we, we it, it's almost it's very similar to Kalkasim there's an yes. order of they cannot enter this area yeah and then whoever enters whatever you see you kill them and we know yeah. that this is happening yeah. so so we know that this is happening um, but let's say up to the 7th of October yeah. from 1956 up to the 7th of October I'm not sure I'm just thinking out loud um, I think that Israel learned that if they need to massacre Palestinians it, from now on it has to be not so intimate yeah. Until then, this would happen every now and then. Um, but afterwards, okay, we do this uh, through artillery, through air power, not intimately. And, uh, and that's the thing. Um, and now there's no black flag, right? Because it doesn't feel like, like you know, just yeah. aesthetically. Yeah. The result is the same. You send, you send, you send a uh, fighter pilot uh, to drop a bomb yeah. and you tell, you tell them there's a target there, right? You don't say just go and shoot whatever. You say, here's a co coordinate. There's a target there. Go and bomb this. It's just a house. It's just a village. But it doesn't feel like... So yeah. when the judge says, hey, you as soldiers, and they teach us as soldiers, you need to disobey an illegal order, they mean a, a, an order that is so patently murderous, then we might disobey it. Um, uh, we're expected to disobey this order. But as long as you mask it just superficially, just aesthetically, a bit differently, then it's okay. So again, the propaganda, it makes you feel like you're moral as long as you don't do it too patently, too obviously, too clearly and too intimately. And that's just for, by the way, this, this is all just about uh, an older kind of Israel that did have these, this troubled um, conscience, Yes. that did want to massacre in a more aesthetic kind of way to not feel like it's massacring today it's not even that today um, a big part of the population has no problem with that again since the 7th of so October. this was said by uh, uh, this uh, I don't remember the name of this guy they interviewed him I think for the film right uh, uh, the guy who practically exposed uh, what happened there he went and uh, he interviewed um, what was the name? Do you remember the name? No. Of the, so uh, he says, yes, back then they still had some uh, moral compass and, and there was outcry about, about when people found out about what happened. There was public outcry and uh, there was a trial, which is like do, my opinion about like the, the, what this means about what society was like. We need to talk about this, but he said, now, not even this. Now, most people would say, yeah, sure, why not? Like, you don't I'll even have openly. to mask it. Yeah. yeah, you don't even need to, to do the, 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 the show. Yeah. And another thing that is like, I want to like... Uh, By the way, we said trial and everything, and, yeah. and we, we kind of were giving credit in a way to a different kind of Israel that at least had some yeah. moral... Um, I don't know if it's better or worse. Conscience. I don't know. But, but, but it's just aesthetic. Yeah. Like, 
So they do this trial, they do the ceremony, and then the soldiers, they go to jail for a few months, then they're released. Yes. And the commanding officer... Yes, they officer, sentenced them to 15 years in, in prison, and a, a year later they were free people, and uh, they, they were uh, free to go around, and they even got perks and benefits. Uh, and uh, and so, so there wasn't real, real, yeah. uh, you know... Uh, punishment for what they did, which is still the case. Uh, killing a Palestinian in Israel is not a punishable offense, uh, basically. No. And a commanding officer uh, was fined like a few cents. Yes, like, like a, the equivalent of 10 cents. And, uh, and uh, one of the uh, residents of uh, Kfar Qasem who was uh, interviewed, he shows like the... the he takes the, out. He, he kept he, it all the years. Yeah, a, a this coin. Is, this is a coin, 10 cents from yeah. 60 ten years agorot, ago. 10 agorot, yeah. uh, putot, 10 putot. This is what the lives of 49 yes. Palestinians, this is what it's worth. Yes. The 49 Yeah, very, very symbolic and very powerful. Uh, and another thing that, uh, that I want to say, and this was actually said in the film, and it kind of sum, sums up um, what you were explaining, that they behave as if um, the, the definition of this manifestly illegal order is something that is meant to prevent crimes. But in reality, the, the, the function of this, uh, you know, rhetorical device, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, judicial device, is the opposite. It's to, it's to uh, enable crimes and to, and to normalize crimes. To say, okay, so there is this thing in the horizon that is called the manifestly illegal order and that you should disobey it's it's murder if it's still murder even if you follow orders and they uh, don't say what it is yeah <laughs> they yeah. just say if it feels yeah. like that just in the, in the horizon somewhere there is this black flag but the black flag is never here it's never here so it's it's meant to normalize what is actually happening all the time so and I remember, I remember also, I, I was in school, I don't remember hearing about this when I was in the, in the military, but I remember hearing about it in, in civics class in school. And they explained to us about the, the manifestly illegal order, and, they, uh, and I remember the structure, like the logical moral structure. And, I, and as a, a boy who liked, you know, logic and, and uh, uh, intellectual uh, discussion, I, was, I, I, I enjoyed this. I thought this was this had you know an aesthetic value and a moral va moral value and and you know logical value. I was like, okay, so manifestly illegal order is something that you should you you have to refuse. It is it is an imperative to refuse this order. An illegal order is something that the imperative is to do. You have to do it. You have to do it. Otherwise, you are a criminal. And then afterwards, they will, uh, 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 you know, they will uh, uh, do a trial to the person, people who who gave the illegal order. If you if you uh, 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 ask the teacher about this, they they will say yes. Afterwards, and I remember I I kind of enjoyed like this, and I think to me when I when I heard about this, I was like yes. There is such a thing called a manifestly illegal order, and when I am a soldier, I will disobey a manifestly illegal order. And I don't know, I don't know what I would do if I were in such a situation. But the truth is that most people who actually get to these situations, they just obey all the orders. Let's talk about what happened after, after the, the screening of the movie. Mm. Yeah. Like... Uh, so there was this this guy uh, this guy first of all the yeah. the population there it's always yeah. interesting yeah. to see the demographics in yeah. these kind of events an older population overwhelmingly yes um ashkenazi which mm -hmm. is like the bourgeois part of israel the kind of liberal left liberal yeah um if you know israeli society a little bit you know the type the, um, the leftist zionist the, the zionist left I, I don't whatever. use the word left that's confusing i say liberal yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. um no th that's why i did the yeah. rotation um, yeah, so what happened? So one of these people... So the, it, was, it was like a panel with uh, the, 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 creators. The, the creators, like the director and the producer. And uh, they, they opened uh, the discussion up for a question. The phone so you can uh, take a drink. They opened the discussion up for, uh, for uh, questions. 
I think it's just your side is more is is easier to hold the phone from, right? I think it's just I can, I just can't hold. No more, it. no more. I got yeah. It. So, but these questions they're never questions. They're always they're always comments. These people need to need to say stuff. They don't want to ask. This they, is part of the demographics. These yeah. older um, Ashkenazi bourgeois Israelis and the males, yeah. the men are so confident and arrogant. They just love to hear themselves talk. So yeah. I knew, I knew this is the kind of people that I study with in the university for some yeah. reason. I knew. I saw the hands go up. I was like, okay, we're gonna hear these old men, white men, just talking and talking arrogantly and giving critique to the to the yeah, filmmakers yeah. right in their face being so strong. they start they do the the compliment sandwich they try to do the compliment sandwich they try this is a very powerful film i learned a lot it's amazing blah, 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 it's a compliment bah. falafel there's no top <laughs> right. it's just it's a compliment and then a lot of shit That's yeah no, no, no. but but blah 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 and then he said and then this guy said but no. <laughs> he wants to get into He wants to be famous. So. He's gonna be uh famous. You wanna get internet famous. Get us some clicks. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> but they started it. That's what he said. They yeah. started it. But I have to say they started it. I have to say they started it. Meaning the Arabs, the Palestinians. And I was like, I was like, fuck, fuck, fuck. And actually, Still there was after this, after this. There was a big reaction from the crowd. Yes, all around. there was. Everyone there was. was like, shut up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but but still, he felt comfortable saying it. He felt comfortable saying it, even after watching an hour-long film about this massacre, this horrible thing. Still, what he had to say was. They started it, and I think it says a lot. It's a kind of type. It's a kind of, it's these kind of Israelis that are like, look, I'm not like the right wing. These crazy guys. I I don't I don't like yeah. what happened in Kfar Qasem and in other places. I'm against this. It's not good. But in the end of the day, you know, they started it. We're the good guys. It's that kind of uh, position. You know, this is the main argument that the, that I hear from from they Zionists. Started. My my dad uses this argument. My uh, brother-in-law is using this argument. Everyone, this is this is like the the, the, the logic of three-year-olds in kindergarten. They started it. They started it. They started it. And it's both irrelevant and false. Like all the arguments of Zionists, both irrelevant and false. I, yes. I would say just false. Um, how is this true that they started? How is that? Even remotely true. Because, because the well, we talk about this a lot about the narrative, right? We everybody knows the. Look, the, I, look, I, I know how. In what sense it's true? Because I used to believe this. But yes. you think you just take one more step to to think about this clearly, and you see how ridiculous it is. Yes. Um, you could claim that m a, a military-like organization, the, the militarization of the conflict started from the Palestinians. You could claim that. Um, but um, it's as if you go into someone's home without using, you know, personal violence. You just walk in their home and you sit down and you start going, oh yeah, here I'll put the TV and you start measuring. And then the, the person living in the home who has a family there comes and asks you, who are you? What are you doing here? And uh, you're like, I'm going to be here. This is mine. And uh, so you call the police and then the police comes up. And it turns out that the police is not going to take this it's, person They're out. on their side. In fact, the police just uh, made a declaration, uh, or a famous letter, saying that they're going to help you. They're, they're going to help this person take over your home. Yeah. And so the whole idea, it's so hip, hypocritical. Like, the idea, we were going we were, we were to come here and uh, uh, appropriate the resources and the land and uh, uh, become... Uh, create a demographic and a political revolution, become the predominant demographic and political force in the land. We're going to take the land and we're going to do this um, without a military force of our own. We are going to rely on the military force of the Turks and then the British, um, but we're not using military force. We're going to um, we're going to take your country in peaceful ways. <laughs> and of course, people don't want to lose their homes and be thrown out to the streets, even if it's in peaceful ways. And if they say stop and you don't stop, and if they do demonstrations and it doesn't stop, 
and if they don't have any other option they're going to start using force so they used force and um, the Zionist side responded in kind very quickly it didn't take very long yeah. and since then it's just um, mutual um, exchanges of massacres where the Zionist side is much more powerful and therefore much more effective in massacring and uh, uh, this is this is a measurable fact so and what you tell what you tell is a metaphor it's it's interesting to see that it actually expresses itself in like an in, in concrete we, we see uh, recently I see on Instagram many many uh, videos of actual cases where people in the homes just go to the homes of Palestinians uh, mainly now in the West Bank yeah they literally do what and they is. literally do what you said as a just metaphor that. this is yeah. this is like the the Miz and Abim kind of thing where where the 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 specific case is just a projection of the of the of the system and and the system is a, an aggregation of the specific cases and it's all it's so weird to see it to see it happening not as a metaphor but just concretely very concretely and to see how people react in this situation from both sides of the of this horrible equation so I have a question that I wanted to to ask you Dan about this film do you think this film is just a more subtle continuation of the thing that it is criticizing and let oh, me just explain explain a little bit more yeah. what what I mean yeah. because so what they're criticizing is how this kind of uh, uh, um, the thing that happened is just a normalization of the 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 the, the bigger crime that uh, that uh, occurred and they bring historians did you did you know about Adam Segal the, the historian that they Adam uh, Raz Adam Raz uh, sorry I, I was thinking of Raz Segal the, another historian and everything got uh, confused Ad, Adam Raz did you did you know this guy of course yeah okay okay so he seemed to me like and a Gadi, serious and Gazi, the other person okay I didn't uh, was so much better okay that's interesting because I felt like Adam uh, uh, Raz. Adam Raz was more like I felt like I connected with the way that he approached things more and I was more suspicious of the other guy the older guy mm -hmm. what's his name Gadiel Ghazi Gadiel Ghazi I I felt like he was more apologetic no. of Zionism no okay no, interesting no. interesting no, no. so my first impression this is superficial impression so Adam Raz is more upfront he's less academic you saw he yes. spoke kind of Maybe oh, that's why more, I liked him because yeah, he's more, more like uh, to the point, tachles. Tachles. Yeah. Uh, so, w what do you know about them? Uh, not much. I, I, Adam was wrote a book about 1948 about yes. pillaging of, yes. of property during 1948. Yes. Um, I know him in connection to Kfar Qasem. He yes. he looked at Mivtza Chafal Peret, Operation Chafal Peret. Yes. Okay. Which this was is another the whole. Um, thing. So, but why do why do we, I, I want to go back to your question? Yes. Yeah, so I, 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 I will explain a little bit more because what, the, what they try to say is that this trial was a sham, it was a show to like actually normalize the, the other crimes that were being committed. But I feel like I feel with everything that Israelis do that they try to like differentiate themselves. Maybe I do it too. I don't know. I need to look at myself as sincerely as I can. But they try to differentiate themselves from like the real criminals, right? But then they do the same thing that they criticize all the time, all the time. So do you think that this movie was another case of this? Like if you go just a little bit wider, you see the same phenomenon. And I, 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 I just don't know. That's why I'm asking. Because I, I had like a suspicion, but I'm not sure. And uh, I'm kind of... Well, no. look, a lot of the movie was reading the protocols where the soldiers were like, I was just following orders. Yeah. Like, yeah, and you shot people in, in cold blood. You, you saw, they stood in front of you. You saw they have no weapons, but you were just given an order to shoot. So just, just very briefly, the idea was they wanted to commit a massacre in order to um, create mayhem and fear and terror to drive the population, the entire population, through the exemplary violence committed against a few dozen people 
um, to drive the whole population into the then Jordanian territory. And so this is something that was completely new to me. It was called Mivtza Hafer Peret, Operation Mole. Yeah, Mole. Um, I, I did not know that this massacre was part of a wider uh, operation or was as, meant as to far, be part and there, then there was some confusion, there was some miscommunication. Yeah, that's... Uh, this is unclear to me okay. still, but... So how we learned about Kfal Qasem was, yes. they said, someone said, hey, we need a curfew because it's wartime and these Arabs, you know, we don't know what they're going to do. We're going to do a curfew. Anyone out of their homes after 5 p.m. is going to get shot. They yeah. just gave an order and someone missed, someone did the, the mistake yeah. of not thinking, oh, we, but there's people out in the fields, the peasants. They, they didn't know that the curfew um, was rescheduled to 5 p.m. Yes, there was always a curfew. This was part of the military regime yeah. on the Palestinian population the curfew was inside made, Israel. Yeah, the curfew was made earlier. You have to yes. be home earlier. And yes. they didn't know. They didn't yes. know. And so they come back and the soldiers shoot them. So I always thought about this as a kind of mistake. Someone yes. kind of didn't think things through. Mm -hmm. And then the soldiers just committed things automatically. Yeah. where they should have said, hey, there's something wrong here. Yeah. It turns out that that's not the story. Um, there was an operation already in the making. In case that there's a war against Jordan, we're going to drive these people out and we're going to do this through the exemplary violence, through the massacre. Of a but few not dozens. because there is a war against Jordan. No, as an but opportunity. As a, yes, as an, to them it was an opportunity to continue the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. It was like they, they just wait for the moment yeah. to, to do the thing. This is not that long after 1948, where yes. these, this yes, was it's committed. nine years. Yeah. Uh, eight years, eight years basically, and, after and, the Nakba. And it's eight years where 1948 kept going. Like there was still um, border wars. Uh, Israeli soldiers would go into a Palestinian uh, village on the other side and commit massacres, Kfal Kibia, Ariel Sharon, Unit 101. So th this is eight, nine years of, it's still 1948. People are still in emer emergency mode. Yeah. People are, feel like still we're in a crisis mode and the Arabs are the enemy. It's that kind of a, even though they're citizens. Um, so yeah, so there's this operation in, in, in place and they're thinking, okay, now there's a war. There might open up a, a Jordanian front, although in the end there wasn't a Jordanian front in this war. It was uh, specifically against Egypt and nothing else. Um, but they, they thought it might. So they said, okay, Operation Mole goes into operation, in, yeah. into, we're going to do effect, it, yeah. into effect. Um, so uh, they do this curfew as a pretext to create a massacre. Yes. It's a wink-wink kind of thing. Yes. Like, okay, we're going to create a situation where we're going to have to massacre, as if it's just because... And the trial proves um, that yeah. the commander said, yes, we want people to, to be die. murdered. We want... As an example. A, 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 to uh, set an example so that... Uh, uh, the people, the, the rest of the people understand that they need to follow the curfew. This was, uh, this is one side, and the other side was that this is was part of something bigger that they wanted to drive people out. So to answer your question, yeah, um, to me all this time, like Fal was, oh, it was, it was just about the soldiers who pulled the trigger. Yeah, that was the focus. Like, how could you commit this order? The people who gave the order, that, would, that didn't matter. It was just a mistake. It was just... Yes, it and, was the, just and they were never really tried, right? What about, what about Ben-Gurion? No, it, did he, was he not part of it? Like, what? Not officially. They didn't connect it to it. Of yeah. course he was. <laughs> yes. Um, so, it was just about the soldiers who pulled the trigger. Yeah. And a lot of the movie was about the soldiers who pulled yeah. the trigger. Because yeah. the protocols, it, it was so, so fascinating and shocking to see... Yeah. Like, they read out the protocols, like, things that the soldiers actually said in the trial a few months, a few years uh, after the, the, the event, um, a few months. And um, just just being very honest about, yes, we murdered, I would have murdered anyone, that was the order, I'm a soldier, I'm supposed to carry out the order. And for us as, as Israelis, after 1956, after this event, you know, the Eichmann trial, they brought this Nazi criminal Eichmann they kidnapped him from Buenos Aires. They brought him uh, to Jerusalem. They did a trial. And Eichmann, you know, famously said, I was just following orders. So in our education, it's so shocking, you know, it's, yeah. so, it's so Nazi. Yeah, the like. cognitive dissonance is too, is yeah. too severe. But, but later when I found out about Operation Mole, and that this wasn't just a mistake. So for you, this wasn't new? It you was fairly new. I think for everyone, it's fairly new. Yeah. Uh, Operation Mole is... I, as far as I know, it's fairly new, and the protocols 
the, the circuit protocols that said more about Operation Mole were revealed recently. Yes. Very recently. Yes, the director of the movie said this. Said so this. it's new to everyone. That they found out sense. about this during the creation of this movie. So I knew about this through Adam Raz. He writes mm. to Haaretz. Mm. So you can learn a lot from Adam Raz on Haaretz. Um, and uh, t so for me, it was as we're watching this movie, I'm, I'm expecting Operation Mole to come up. And this is the important thing to me. I'm like, don't make this about the psychology of the individual soldier. How could he carry out the order or not carry out the order? It's about the people on top. Don't make it about the people at the bottom. It's about the bigger picture. Um, it's not just about uh, the morality of individuals. It's about a system. Yes. It's about this whole project of settler colonialism. Um, but they didn't say... Okay, so So, here, so yeah. I just want to say, so yeah. for a, a big part of the movie, it was like... It was about the soldiers. It was. It was yeah. I was waiting for Operation Mole. Yeah. Where is it going to come? Where is it going to come? And then when it came, I did feel better. I was like, okay, it's not going to yeah. do the thing. Okay. It is going to be. Yeah. It's not. It's not going to do the thing where it's kind of telling us the truth and making us think, but actually distracting us from what's really important. Mm -hmm. And then they did talk about what's really important. And yet, I, if I had made the movie, I would have connected that to 1948. Yes. I would have said something about. This is just a continuation of 1948 and about how this happened over and over in 1948 um, so, so that you do get the bigger picture and maybe say something about, okay, so we have 1948 to 1956, this happens, and then what, hap what about after 1956? Yes. It doesn't stop, but it changes form. The changes whole narrative, form. the whole context of what happened, yeah. the whole historical process. Of I would have given a little bit more of before and after. Yeah. That would have been me. So here is what, I, 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 when we are speaking, I'm processing this and I'm thinking about my own question. And here is what still bothered me. That the whole shock value of the movie was based on the fact. And this, the director said this, that this is why she wanted to, to make the movie about this and not about something else. That the shock value was mm. that... Israeli citizens were massacred. Yeah, this was, these were Palestinians who were technically Israeli citizens. Yes. Without many rights, but technically. So, so she talks about like the, the dramatic realization of the Palestinians who are Israeli citizens that the, being citizens in the uh, state of Israel does not protect them really. Okay? And I, I agree with this point. I think it's an important point. But I still ask myself, why is it more shocking that people who have citizenship are being massacred and not people who don't have citizenship? And the only way that you can think that this is important is if you buy this story, right? If you buy this story of the project, right? That, that, that this country is something that is supposed to protect people mm -hmm. that that states are something that are is supposed to, in general is something that is supposed to protect people and that and that this state in particular which is actually a settler colonialist project is something that is supposed to protect people and not something that as you described uh, 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 very accurately uh, a machine that is meant to uh, steal resources from one group of people to uh, and give them to another group of people which is what it actually is and this is the thing that makes me think that that, that this is another sin that, that like the very thing that they are criticizing is what they are doing again again and and it makes me think like how many people who are actual Israeli citizens see reality for what it is and can acknowledge reality for what it is and can actually like deconstruct what is going on in their own mind and the narratives that they were taught and the things that they consider part of their identity and, and, and so forth and so on. And I, I, I think so few, so few. Like even even if you produce an, a, a full-length documentary that is meant to deconstruct the narrative, still you you, you only go eighty percent of the way, and going eighty percent of the way in some sense is like I don't know if it's even better than going zero percent of the way, or maybe it, in some sense it's worse because then you say I'm okay, I'm 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 one of the good guys. I don't. So this still bothers me. Yeah. 
still a good movie, an important movie. Yes, yes. I'm not. I'm not saying that this movie should uh, should not have been. I, I, I'm just say, uh, expressing that I still have some some discomfort. Discomfort. We have great documentaries being very real about Zionism, about the Nakba. Um, we have a lot of literature like it's out there. This is not. Yeah. Soviet Russia 1950 something this is not yeah. North Korea the information is out there and it doesn't matter much as Noam Chomsky shows yeah. liberal democracies you can have the information out there no one goes to a gulag if they talk about this mm. and still the uh, the great bulk of Israeli society is going to remain ignorant of the facts just like yeah. the great bulk of American society is ignorant about America and, uh, and so on and so forth um, yes they realize that hiding the thing is, is uh, they, they realize that the Streisand effect, right? When you try to hide things, it doesn't, it doesn't work. When you, when you put them in the open, but you tell people that it's better to ignore, that works much better. Streisand? Why is this? The Streisand effect. Uh, I don't remember the, the exact uh, story, but there was... Barbara Streisand? Barbara Streisand did something that was uh, <laughs> reprehensible, and she tried to cover ah. it up, and then it made the story become uh, famous. I don't remember, remember exactly what, but here, I'm talking about this. You see, you see how badly it worked? And uh, I, you, you look up the Streisand effect, and you will find out the, the exact story. I don't remember. I just remember that uh, Barbara Streisand sucks. No, that, that's, that's mainly what I remember. Okay. But this is like the, 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 the concept that you can, that you can use to, to, to explain this kind of... When, when, you, when you try to hide something, you put the focus on it. So, so they don't hide. They just say, oh, this is not important. Well, they hide as much as they can, but it doesn't matter that much. Yeah. Like, it's it's interesting. It's I don't know what it says about psychology and maybe okay. So maybe maybe let's say let's say what about Kafar Kasem? So when you put the story, I'm sorry. Yeah. When you put the story in people's heads yeah. early of who's the good guys, who's yes. the bad guys, yes. then it doesn't. The facts yeah. don't matter afterwards. The facts don't matter. It's they the won't framing. acknowledge. It's they'll the be framing. like it didn't happen. And then even even when they don't acknowledge, it, it will stay. It won't matter. It won't matter. So you can t you can do all these films, you can write all these history books. The bulk of history society won't really understand what's going on. Okay, so I think uh, we've been talking for almost 45 minutes. Do you do you want to say something to to finish up this uh, impromptu uh, discussion? Um, no, that was that was quite a, an experience. I'm tired. That was very emotionally draining. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm glad this film is out there and uh... I just I just want to say one thing. Yeah, go ahead. All uh, uh, all the time when we were watching this movie I felt disgust and hatred and um, and just like How do you say Slida? Aversion? Like, like just, I, I was just disgusted by what I saw. And I was like, yeah, this is, when I hear the stories and I'm like, yeah, this is, this is Holocaust stories. These people that did, that did the things, the system that, that, that okay, made I have, these things I have happen. to say something from the film. Yeah. One of the children who um, narrowly escaped being murdered. Yeah. His friends were murdered. He narrowly escapes, yeah. and he runs to a cave, yeah. and he yeah. stays there for a few days. He's afraid to come out. He's sure. He's sure that okay. Now the Israelis are just murdering all the Arabs. Holocaust, genocide. Uh, he said this explicitly. Yeah. They, uh, I thought that what they are doing is exactly what was done to them uh, uh, by the Nazis. That they are now doing that this. That they are now doing this. So he this. hid in a cave. Yes. He, he thought. If I come out, they're going to murder us, murder me, because they're, they're just murdering everyone. Yes, Which yes. was true for that yes. particular place where he found himself. Yes. He was so, so horrified, so shocked, so traumatized. Yes, he and just I, hid in I, a cave I, for I a few found days. myself. I found my consciousness just connecting with his consciousness. Like I, I, I found myself unable to help, but imagine the way that he felt the the, the complete, you know, defenselessness that that he felt the complete. Uh, uh, like no way out 
And this feeling was familiar to me, and the way that it was familiar to me was it, it was the same feeling that I felt when I heard Holocaust stories told by Holocaust survivors. Like it's the same, it's the same kind of thing, that there are stronger people who are controlling your destiny and who hate you and who think that it's okay to kill you and to kill everyone who is like you. And I can only imagine how it feels. I can only imagine. But even just imagining it is chilling to the bone. And this is, I don't know, I, I, I feel more and more, I feel hatred towards the Zionist project and even towards specific, like individual Zionists. And I don't, uh, I mean, this is a whole new subject, what to do with this hatred that I feel in, in my heart more and more and more. The more I hear about these stories, I don't know. Do you want to leave it open? Do you want to finish here? Do you want to say something about this? I think it's, I don't know, like, to me, as I study history and yeah. personally, yeah. um, the ideal is to find empathy, is to understand that we're all humans in the situation, operating the situation. Yeah. But anger and hatred is part of the process. So yeah. for me personally, it's this constant cycle yeah. of um, I hear something, I'm angry, I can't forgive, I yeah. hate. And then, and then I also see the humanity that is, that is always in all of us. And then I'm angry again. It's this back and forth. That's just me personally. Okay. So I think this is a, as good a place as any to, <laughs> to finish this. Thanks for listening to our very uh, scattered uh, thoughts. Bye, guys.